Okay, welcome everyone. Um, I think it's about time to get started. Um, can you guys let me know if, if you're hearing me okay, someone? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, I have my slides up. Hopefully you guys can see those. Um, <clears throat> hopefully I won't mess this up, but I think we're set up here and in pretty good shape and ready to get started. Um, I'm Kent Perry from Northwestern. I'm going to talk today a little bit about the management of small renal masses and this lecture is going to kind of focus on um, firstly the you know observation and the studies that have been done about observation of small renal masses as well as um, incorporating biopsy uh, into the decision making process in terms of managing these patients <clears throat> and then we'll review a little bit kind of you know in most of those studies pertain to the sporadic renal cell carcinomas and then i'll do a quick overview of the familial renal cell carcinomas and go over some information about uh, the management of uh, those lesions um, i don't have any relevant disclosures i'm supposed to say that just so you know so the epidemiology of these renal masses um, it, we've seen a growing incidence of small renal masses. There are 480,000 people who live with kidney camps in the United States, and there's a growing incidence over the past 40 years, um, from 1975 to 7.1 per 100,000 to 15.2 in 2014. Um, there's about 14,400 deaths annually, <clears throat> and that curve really hasn't changed much over time, so we haven't really been very successful in declining uh, mortality rates. That's changed just a little bit recently uh, in pa patients with metastatic disease with the, um, uh, the uh, immunotherapeutic agents that have been real successful in treating some of these patients that we really didn't have before. Um, but before that time, even though we were diagnosing these at an earlier stage, the uh, annual death rate didn't really decline at all. Uh, so, you know, worldwide, um, and by the way, the, the incidence of uh, renal cell carcinoma is about a tenth that of prostate cancer, so much less common, as you guys know. Um, the annual cases per 100,000 people, I mean, this is a lot of this is dependent upon how frequently uh, these countries are using uh, cross-sectional body imaging in terms of how likely these are to be discovered. <clears throat> Uh, it's more common in males than in females. Um, not a huge difference between races, uh, between Caucasians and African Americans and Asians. And there's a slightly lower incidence in the Asian Pacific Islander uh, incidence in both males and females. But again, some of this can potentially be related to how frequent, um, how frequently cross-sectional imaging is is being obtained. And again, of course, it's more common in the in older populations, uh, 55 to 75 years old. So risk factors for renal cell carcinoma, um, obesity and smoking are two ones that are pretty obvious. Uh, end stage renal disease with acquired renal cystic disease, uh, typically with papillary renal cell carcinomas. Um, people with a prior history of renal cell carcinoma are more likely to develop um, an ipsilateral or contralateral uh, renal cell carcinoma, potentially diabetes and heavy metal. And there's an association, likely association between cadmium exposure and renal cell carcinoma. Smoking is a big one. Another one that's not on here is just being male, uh, getting older. Um, so the survival rate has been growing over time. So 76% of patients survive five years after the diagnosis. And that's, that's uh, grown significantly in the past decades. And there's been also a, a migration uh, shift in terms of the stage of diagnosis where the majority of these are being uh, diagnosed when they're localized now, of course. And um, also they're being diagnosed incidentally. Um, most often these are found when somebody does uh, comes in with abdominal pain and you get the obligatory CT scan in the emergency room and there's a small renal mass. So just a brief overview of the staging. Um, 
I think this has changed three times since uh, I've been in my residency and in practice. Um, T1A is uh, four, less than four centimeters in size, T1B four to seven centimeters. Um, T2 is greater than seven centimeters and that's broken down to T2A, which is seven to 10. T2B greater than 10 centimeters. T3A is renal vein involvement or perinephric fat involvement. T3B is involvement to the IVC, and T3C is um, IVC above the uh, diaphragm. Uh, T4 is extension into adjacent structures, such as the adrenal gland, gerotus fascia, and then you have regional lymphadenopathy and distant metastasis, of course. Um, interestingly, the uh, um, T3A is, is, is not exactly the, the risk associated with just renal vein involvement, and with perinephric fat involvement is not equal. Um, perinephric fat involvement has a poor prognosis. So when we look at the uh, SEER database, we see that the renal tumor size of presentation has steadily and consistently decreased nationally. Um, and we also see that patients more recently diagnosed um, have improved survival um, but this could be attributed to decreased tumor sizes in the later uh, cohorts. And we've also seen relative survival advantage uh, independent of si size compared to the, some of the earlier uh, patients studied. Um, but we, we also see that um, as you look at the overall mortality rate um, of renal cell carcinomas that have been diagnosed in the U.S. and the, these go uh, up in size as you go up the chart, the overall mortality rate has increased uh, over time. And this may have to do with things such as age of diagnosis, but the cancer sp specific mortality rate uh, over time has not really changed. We haven't really bent that curve significantly. So <clears throat> this is kind of an interesting slide. Uh, it's, it's demonstrating the fact that um, if you look at um, if, you, if you have uh, an effective treatment for existing disease, you'll find what you'll find is an increasing five-year survival and a decreasing mortality rate um, with uh, no change in the incidence. And if you're, finding, if you're finding more cases early, which is what we're doing, and the um, early treatment is effective, what you'll do is you'll increase the five-year survival and decrease mortality. Of course, the incidence will increase. But if your early treatment is ineffective, you'll increase five-year survival, you'll increase the incidence, but you won't change mortality. And that's, that's kind of what we're seeing um, in, in, uh, in, our, um, in our group. And, and we're not really changing the mortality rate, suggesting that early treatment of these masses is, is not effective. So if you look at the management of small renal masses and, and the, what is a small renal mass? Well, certainly T, um, you know, uh, uh, four centimeters or less in size, uh, T1A. Uh, some, some of the other studies have used different cutoffs and I'll get into that in a minute. But the evolution of the treatment of these things, um, we, we've seen a change in terms of partial nephrectomy gaining um, popularity, radical nephrectomy declining, um, and, 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 and how often that's done. Ablative therapies are becoming more popular too. Um, but I'm gonna make an argument that for a lot of these active surveillance is probably a more appropriate therapy. Uh, or, or tool that we can incorporate uh, in these patients. Um, the rationale for this is that ultimately 20 to 30% of small renal masses are found to be benign. And we know that, you know, uh, these are frequently angiomyolipomas. Now an angiomyolipoma is gonna be typically easy to, um, to recognize on cross-sectional body imaging because of the presence of fat. But uh, lipid poor angiomyolipomas are, are difficult to identify. Um, we know that ultrasound can be helpful. They have a hyperechoic appearance on ultrasound almost universally. Um, that is uh, uh, um, 
a very helpful tool in, in identifying these these lesions. Not much else really shows uh, up as hyperechoic on ultrasound. Um, oncocytoma, uh, metanephric adenomas, and hemorrhagic cysts are all possible or, or in the differential diagnosis. Um, another consideration is greater than 50% or low grade. And really it's more in the order of about 1% uh, risk of progression to metastatic disease in this group. Um, let's go on here. So there are several um, active surveillance programs that are, that are ongoing. Uh, this is some of them. Uh, we're going to talk about some of them later. The Renal Cell Cor Consortium of Canada. Um, and you can see their inclusion and exclusion criteria. Um, most of these use T1A as an inclusion criteria. Um, <clears throat> uh, some of these have different greater than three year life expectancy. Um, exclusion criteria are almost always going to see hereditary renal cell carcinoma syndromes. Um, as an exclusionary criteria. Um, they had different surveillance, surveillance protocols. Uh, generally, uh, cross-sectional body imaging or ultrasound every six to 12 months was incorporated. So in terms of progression on active surveillance, these were uh, defined differently. In the Canadian study, it's uh, increased to over four centimeters in size. Um, doubling in size in a year or less, which is that's pretty uh, unusual, actually, in the development of metastasis. On the DISARM trial, um, again, getting growth greater than four centimeters in size was defined as progression, or growth greater than five millimeters per year, and I think that's more reasonable than doubling in size in less than a year, or the presence of hematuria. And if you look at, uh, this is a, uh, uh, meta-analysis of uh, active surveillance studies. And if you look at the results here, you see the probability of progression to treatment, usually around 20 to 30%. The outliers are kind of highlighted in this slide. A uh, progression of met metastatic disease, one or 2%. Uh, Cancer-specific mortality, uh, very low. And uh, overall mortality is gonna be uh, kind of all over the place based upon the patient population that's being evaluated. Um, one common factor uh, in these studies is that non-growing masses do not metastasize. Um, and that's important to keep in mind. So uh, this is the uh, DISARM trial. Uh, this is comparative effectiveness of management options for patients with small renal masses, a prospective study. Um, Again, this is this arm, so the small renal mass is defined as T1A. 638 patients, uh, 231 underwent partial nephrectomy, uh, 41 radical nephrectomy, 27 ablation, and just over half or 339 are in the active surveillance group. Um, the cancer-specific survival at seven years was not different between the groups. Uh, it was a little bit lower in the partial nephrectomy group, but that wasn't significant. The overall survival at seven years uh, was different. Um, it was a little bit lower in the active surveillance group, and I'm gonna show you a slide in a moment that kind of explains uh, why that was. And if you adjust for the uh, comorbidities and age, uh, you'll see that they're, all the groups are actually equal. Um, function, glomerular function rate was lowest in the uh, um, radical nephrectomy patients, of course, uh, but comparable in all other groups. And also they did quality of life studies and uh, the mental health scores were uh, similar in all the groups. The physical um, uh, quality of life scores were actually a little bit lower in the active surveillance group, but this again goes back to their age and Charleston comorbidity index uh, is higher in the active surveillance group and that shouldn't be a surprise. But in, in summary, there were excellent outcomes in all groups and active surveillance is a reasonable option for um, select patients given their comparable oncologic and health outcomes. So this is a slide that just looks at the management of these patients and over here, this is an unadjusted, oh, sorry. This is an unadjusted 
analysis. And over on the right-hand side is the adjusted multivariate analysis. And if you look at um, partial nephrectomy as the reference group, if you look at nephrectomy, ablation or AS is active surveillance in these groups. Um, if you look at their adjusted multivariate analysis that takes into consideration their age, which you can see on this slide is an independent uh, variable risk and their Charleston comorbidity index. Um, the, the groups are all partial nephrectomy, radical nephrectomy, ablation and active surveillance are, are all equal in terms of uh, all cause mortality outcomes. And so um, if you look at small renal masses in elderly patients, um, they are more likely to die of unrelated comorbidities and they have increased risk of surgical complications. And this is a slide that just looks at um, the uh, utilization of various management tools. And this is a 65 to 74, 74 to um, 84 year old group. And then over here is 85 year old and older group. Um, it, you can see that non-operative management has been increasing over time um, as, and, as well as has ablation and partial nephrectomy relative to radical nephrectomy, but it hasn't been increasing enough. Um, but at least we've, we've been trending in the right direction. And I think, you know, this slide, the last data point on this slide was 2010. I think if we had an updated uh, slide to 2020, we'd see that this uh, active surveillance has become more uh, popular because it's just people discuss it more often and it's, it's an accepted tool. And, the, you know, these studies, including DISARM, have helped uh, advance that, um, that management style. So this is kind of an interesting slide. Um, if, if you look at um, even large renal mass uh, observation, um, this is a more recent study from Urologic Oncology. The, um, this looked at competing mortality in higher risk patients and the average mass size was uh, 4.9 centimeters. So these were T1B on average. Um, average age was 73 years old. Um, the Charleston, 73% had Charleston comorbidity index scores of four or greater. Median follow-up time in this study was four years. Um, one thing that was observed is the median growth rate was a little bit faster in the larger renal mass group, uh, four millimeters per year as opposed to the two to three millimeters per year that you typically see uh, in the smaller renal mass group. Um, in this study at the four-year follow-up, three out of 100 patients died from kidney cancer, but 30 of 100 patients died from other causes. So this looks at the, um, the dashed line in this graph is the probability of mortality um, from, whoops, excuse me, from all uh, causes whereas the solid line is the probability of the development of metastatic disease um, from renal cell carcinoma. And you can see it's at five years, 6% of developing metastatic disease, not, not death, and 22% uh, of these patients died from other causes. So this is obviously applicable in a limited high-risk patient population, but it's useful information to help counsel patients, especially elderly or very high risk people who you diagnose with a five centimeter renal mass. They don't all necessarily have to have surgery. Uh, it has to be evaluated carefully in terms of the risk benefit analysis. So when we're considering uh, evaluating these masses for the risk of them being malignant or benign, there's many factors that we can look at. Um, you know, the 44.9% of predominantly exophytic tumors are benign, whereas 15.8% of endophytic tumors, predominantly endophytic tumors are benign. And the patients who have a nephrometry score of less than eight are more, than, more likely to be benign. So if we look at the, I know you guys are all familiar with this, this is the renal nephrometry score. Um, it was originally developed, I think, mainly for, uh, for doing uh, partial nephrectomy in terms of evaluating for postoperative, perioperative risk. Um, 
it looks at the size of the tumor and it's broken down into one point, two points, and three points for T1A, T1B, and T2. Um, it looks at the endophytic, exophytic uh, properties of the mass um, and uh, looks at the nearness of the tumor to the collecting system or the central sinus fat. And it's broken down by uh, millimeters in terms of its proximity. Um, anterior, posterior is just a description. Uh, obviously, if you're doing a transabdominal approach for partial nephrectomy, the posterior masses tend to be more difficult. Uh, and then it looks at location relative to the polar lines. Uh, and those that uh, either entirely in the upper or lower pole get a lower score. Those that cross the polar line get two points, and those that are sitting entirely within between the polar lines or across the mid-polar line, I get three points. Padua score, it's, it's very similar. Um, it's, they're not too different. You can look at the uh, point distribution here on the slide. Um, it's, it's significant, again, because the higher the score, the greater the risk of malignancy. Uh, also, for perioperative planning, warm ischemic time goes up, estimated blood loss goes up, and conversion to uh, radical nephrectomy also goes up. Um, there is no difference in the follow-up renal function scores or an overall or cancer-specific survival uh, based on the Padua score, but it's still it's a helpful, um, helpful tool. So again, <clears throat> If we're wanting to try to tell if these are malignant or benign, you can get some clues from the nephrometry, do a score, is there exophytic or endophytic characteristics? But ultimately, we're probably going to be looking at doing a biopsy if we want to truly demonstrate whether these are benign or malignant, obviously. So in terms of the uh, sensitivity and specificity, um, one of the things that we'll hit on a couple times is that the, um, whether you're doing a core biopsy or an FNA makes a difference in the quality of the biopsy. The, um, you know, we've had an issue at, at our institution where, you know, the uh, um, cytopathologists have been doing the biopsies and reading them. And, and you know, they've combined FNAs with core biopsies, but the core biopsies are, are superior. And really, I think that the, um, uh, it's like what's in your wallet, right? I mean, who's reading your pathology? It's probably better off in the realm of surgical pathology as opposed to cytopathology. Uh, we still haven't broken out of that mold yet, but uh, maybe one of these days we will. At least we're doing core biopsies now, so that's an improvement. Um, just kind of a side note, you know, you can have the coexistence of malignant and benign tissue. Uh, this is mostly seen in oncocytoma, chromophobe, RCC hybrids, which you see in Burho today. Um, that's not very common, but it, it can happen. So this is a meta-analysis of the uh, diagnostic accuracy and specificity of uh, percutaneous renal tumor biopsies. Um, published in European Neurology not too long ago. As a comp combined over 5,000 patients, the median diagnostic rate was 92%. Again, poor biopsies, sensitivity and specificity was superior to FNA. And you get, there is good agreement between the biopsy and surgical specimen on histologic type, but there is not good uh, agreement on uh, Furman grade. So, um, you cannot use the biopsy to, to, in terms of grade to help you decide upon uh, your management strategy. It's just not very good. Um, at very low risk of complications and uh, hematoma requiring transfusion rates less than 1%. So the conclusions are renal tumor biopsy is safe with high diagnostic yield and better performance with the core biopsy. None of that's very surprising, but good numbers to know. So the non-diagnostic biopsy, um, I usually quote a rate of approximately 20% uh, to my patients because a lot of the patients who are biopsying, the, the masses tend to be on the smaller side. So it's more common in FNA than core biopsy. Um, 
Of course, cystic lesions are going to have a higher non-diagnostic rate than solid lesions. And most of the time, most people aren't going to try to biopsy cystic lesions because of the fact that theoretical concern of just popping the cyst and potentially uh, seeding some of the, um, if it's a cystic clear cell, renal cell carcinoma, seeding some of those tumor cells. Um, Non-enhancing or weakly enhancing masses. Um, people who are large with a larger than 13 centimeter skin to tumor distance size is going to increase your non-diagnostic biopsy rate. And one of the things that, that's important that I want to emphasize is tumor size less than two centimeters. You know, it's hard for your radiologist or if you guys are doing the biopsies yourselves, it's hard to hit a tumor that's less than two centimeters in size. So I wouldn't rec and, and you know, what's, what's really the point in doing that? Um, you know, they pose such little risk when they're so small that, you know, observe it and see if it's going to grow. And if it ever hits the two centimeter point, then that's when you biopsy it. And you, and before I go on, you want to, one of the things that I've learned is that if you want to have a frustrated patient, uh, get a non-diagnostic biopsy and then suggest maybe they either, you know, re-biopsy or, or, or go to surgery based upon the fact that you had a non-diagnostic biopsy is very, very frustrating. So if you can minimize the non-diagnostic biopsy rate, you're going to be happier in your patients too. So in the biopsy, um, again, there's a high concordance in the histologic type. It's higher for clear cell renal cell carcinoma, but the nuclear grade concordance is poor. That's just reemphasizing what was on the prior slide. So here's kind of a, a decision tree uh, in terms of whether you biopsy or, or not. Um, you know, typically, and, and we all learn this, if you history of lymphoma or you suspect metastatic disease, then you would, you know, probably want to do a biopsy. Um, if the patient is a active surveillance candidate uh, and the biopsy is going to help in your decision-making process, as shown here, then then a biopsy is probably a worthwhile endeavor. If an ablation is planned, biopsy is, is uh, useful information because it can help you in terms of uh, following the patient post-ablation. And if the, is the patient or a team willing to, to observe a benign lesion, of course, that goes into your decision-making process because if the patient is not going to be willing to observe a benign lesion, then there's no point in doing a biopsy. So again, the risk of biopsy, less than 5% overall complication risk, less than 1% major complication, uh, less than 0.01% track seating risk. And this is really limited to a handful of case reports, predominantly in uh, 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 sarcomatoid tumors. And again, renal, renal grading is not accurate and do not use this in your decision-making process. Uh, one other thing that can be a little bit helpful is a SESTA-MEB spec CT scan. Uh, if you're trying to differentiate oncocytoma, this has been demonstrated more recently to be effective at, uh, at, at demonstrating oncocytoma over renal cell carcinomas. Um, it's not very good in terms of uh, hybrid tumors. Um, I think uh, it, it it's positive also in the oncocytoma chromophobe renal cell carcinoma hybrid tumors. So for Berthoud Dubé patients or someone who has a hybrid tumor, not help. So a couple active surveillance key points um, uh, is that the average growth rate is two to three millimeters per year. Uh, 25 to 30 percent don't demonstrate any growth over the follow-up period. Only a 1% risk of metastatic disease when the tumor is less than three centimeters. So that's a common question that you'll get and something that you'll want to explain to the patient. The risk is not zero, but it's very low. And so active surveillance is equal to surgery in terms of overall and cancer-specific mortality rates um, when, when, you, when you adjust for other comorbidities and the active surveillance group is equal to the others. And the active surveillance group is superior to radical nephrectomy in terms of morbidity and overall renal function. Um, 
A couple more key points, as we mentioned, the PADUA and renal score do help determine the risk of malignancy. Um, so you can get some clues from imaging and the appearance of the mass. Uh, renal biopsy is underutilized. This is changing, but I think it's still underutilized. And you should wait until the mass is greater or equal to two centimeters until you uh, undertake a biopsy attempt. Um, another key point is consider competing mortality risks in elderly patients or patients with significant comorbidities, even with T1B uh, renal masses. Um, the whole picture needs to be evaluated with those patients. So um, moving on, let's look at um, some uh, multiple and bilateral renal masses and look at some of the quickly overview, some of the familial renal cell carcinoma syndromes. Um, so in this group, first of all, consider genetic testing, depending upon the, you know, what other uh, features are associated with their multiple bilateral renal masses. Typically, you'll want to biopsy the largest renal mass as this confers the highest risk. Uh, there is a high uh, level of concordance rate between uh, synchronous bilateral masses and ipsilateral masses. It's generally 80 to 90 percent. Um, so if you biopsy one mass, you're likely, but not 100%, uh, likely to find the uh, similar histology. And also incorporating MAG3 arenograms in order to get a baseline uh, function and to tell your function uh, between surgeries if someone's likely facing multiple uh, procedures. Um, kind of a busy slide, but review some of the hereditary uh, renal cell carcinomas. Um, the one, you know, this is, a, this is just showing the clear cell carcinoma associated VHL, BAP1 mutations, uh, SDH, succinate dehydrogenase. dehydrogenase. Um, and then we'll overview some of the papillary renal cell carcinoma familial diseases, which includes HLRCC um, and hereditary papillary uh, kidney cancer. Um, in VHL, you know, we know that you have associated pheochromocytomas as well as well as renal pancreatic cysts um, and pheochromocytoma. Um, in HLRCC, you see uterine leiomyosarcomas, an increased risk of bladder cancer also. Um, and it, we'll get into a little bit more uh, detail in these in just a moment. Um, so some of the other ones, uh, bird hog dubé, uh, you see chromophobe and uh, oncocytoma, and you can see hybrid tumors, uh, tend to be a little bit less aggressive on the spectrum, uh, typically presenting uh, with, uh, frequently at least, with spontaneous pneumothorax and the finding of pulmonary cysts, and also the, the typical fibrofolliculomas across the face, cheeks, or even upper uh, thorax. Um, Tuberous sclerosis, um, you know, typically present with angiomyelipomas, can have renal cysts, and these patients actually have a small, less than 5% risk of developing renal cell carcinoma. I'll go into some of the more individual ones in just a moment. Now, it's important to keep in mind that obviously the, the small renal mass, the active surveillance studies, those were done with spontaneous, not familial, renal cell carcinoma. So this is the other side of the spectrum. Um, von Hippel-Lindau is probably kind of the classic familial renal cell carcinoma, the best described. Um, VHL is a tumor suppressor that's, uh, that regulates HIF, hypoxia-inducing factor. It's found on chromosome 3P. Uh, it's an autosomal dominant um, a trait that with 100% penetrance. Uh, you can see tumors, or renal masses develop in young patients, and uh, the Bosniak scores are relevant in these patients. So benign appearing cysts frequently will be early cystic renal cell cancers. Um, you can also see hemangioblastomas of the spine, brain, and retina, uh, endolymphatic sac tumors, the auditory canal, cyst adenomas of the epididymis, and you can see cysts and cyst adenomas in the pancreas as well as neuroendocrine tumors, um, as well as pheochromocytoma in this group. Another thing that, just kind of a side uh, uh, note that, that 
Don't forget patients with polycystic kidney disease. Obviously, they're not, incre not at increased risk for renal cell carcinoma, but you do have to consider the, the increased risk in aneurysms and send them to appropriate uh, evaluations for neurology or neurosurgery in those patients. So tuberous sclerosis, um, this is the TS TSC1 or 2 gene that encode Hamerton and tuberin. Um, these are also aut autosomal dominant with a high penetrance. 60-80% um, have uh, renal manifestations with cysts or angiomyolipomas. Um, low risk of renal cell carcinoma, but it's, it's elevated. Um, this, is the, this is the group that you typically see hemorrhage with the angiomyolipomas. Um, you know, the spontaneous hemorrhage risk with angiomyolipoma is not so clear um, because the denominator is not known very well. So when counseling patients on the risk of spontaneous hemorrhage that have the AML that hits four or five centimeters, it's, it's difficult. So tuberous sclerosis can also be associated with mental retardation and seizure, seizures, uh, glioneural neuronal hamartomas, and astrocytomas. Um, and typically you'll see facial angiofibromas um, as characteristics uh, in, in these patients. So HLRCC, um, hereditary lyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomyomy
kind of unusual solid brown to red appearing tumors. Um, they can also be associated with uh, pheochromocytomas or paragangliomas. Um, they typically, these have differing prognosis. If they have sarcomatoid features or, necro or necrosis, uh, they tend to be more aggressive and should be treated more like the type two papillaries and uh, HLRCC and not watched if they're smaller. Um, otherwise, they tend to behave less aggressively. So, you know, we incorporate the three centimeter, three centimeter rule typically in these patients. Um, if one mass goes greater than three centimeters, just because of the risk of developing metastatic disease, you should remove all the visible tumors in that kidney. <clears throat> the goal in that approach is to minimize the number of times that you're uh, reoperating on these people. You only have a few times in and out of with one kidney uh, before things start getting really difficult with that. Goals to preserve renal function, increase the time between surgeries while minimizing the risk of metastasis. Um, and as we mentioned before, the exceptions are HLRCC and the succinate dehydrogenase uh, associated tumors uh, that demonstrate uh, sarcomatoid or necro necrotic changes. Um, and it's a reasonable approach to get an FDG PET uh, early in these people to rule out metastatic disease. And so I think we're about 40 minutes. Um, so let me go back and review some of the take home points of active surveillance and let's uh, get to questions. Let me just back up here. I just want to emphasize these key points again. Uh, Takeaway points the average growth rate of these smaller tumors is about two to three millimeters per year. Uh, helps you calculate how long until these things are going to approach three to four centimeters if you're counseling an elderly patient. Uh, and additionally, 25, approximately 25% do not demonstrate any growth over the follow-up period. So again, when you're having this discussion, you know, if you let them know that some of these really just don't demonstrate growth over time and taking a little bit of time and seeing what happens, that this might be a smart initial management strategy. Uh, the 1% risk of metastatic disease when they're less than three centimeters in size. So you can't tell anyone that there's a 0% chance, and you guys know that, but it's small. Active surveillance is equal to surgery in terms of overall on cancer-specific mortality as a, as a, a treatment option or non-treatment option. And then active surveillance is superior to radical nephrectomy or surgery in terms of morbidity uh, and specifically renal function with radical nephrectomy. Um, Nobody really advocates radical nephrectomy these days in small renal mass. Um, so additional key points, the PADUA and renal nephrometry score do help determine the risk of malignancy. Renal bi biopsy is underutilized, wait till the mass is two centimeters. And even in T slightly larger masses, consider competing mortality risks um, in the elderly. And so with that, I'll open it up to questions. Um, not really sure how, <clears throat> how this works at this point, but. Um, thank you so much for your talk. Sorry, I can help uh, uh, with these questions. Uh, we got a lot of great questions here. So um, one of the first questions is, in your practice, what do you do with the renal uh, mass biopsy that comes back as oncocytoma, given uh, the non-diagnostic rate of the biopsy and, um, as you mentioned uh, earlier, the concomitant malignancy uh, possibility? Yeah, so, you know, it's obviously, it's always the um, uh, chromophobe versus uh, oncocytoma. I think the pathologists have gotten a little bit better um, on being able to determine between the two just by histology and also immunostaining helps them. But there's still, you know, still can be times when the two are difficult to distinguish. Um, what I'll typically tell patients is that if we get a biopsy and they, what the pathology report will typically say is oncocytic tumor favor oncocytoma. And if and they use the immunostaining to help them come to that conclusion, and if that's what the conclusion is, and the patient favors observation, I will continue to observe them. And if the tumor approaches um, three to four centimeters, 
uh, especially approaches four, uh, we might consider uh, repeating the biopsy to make sure we, we get consistent results. Okay. Um, someone mentioned that in their radiology department, um, uh, ultra contrast enhanced ultrasound is frequently used for cystic renal masses. Um, is that the same at your institution? And what do you think about this uh, imaging modal modality? Um, yeah, I think it can be it can be helpful. Um, you know, it it, it dim it's a good test to demonstrate um, uh, enhancement within the septations and the cyst. Um, I haven't seen a whole lot of data uh, in terms of comparing it to, you know, the Bosniak standard is CT scan. Uh, MRI is very good too. MRI does tend to overstate Bosniak classification scores. Um, but I haven't seen data that compares uh, end histology to um, contrast enhanced ultrasound because it's, it's, you know, relatively newer. And that, that may be just because I haven't seen it, but... Um, we d I do sometimes use it to, to help with, uh, uh, as kind of a third test if I've looked at uh, CT scan and MRI. Okay. Um, another question, does a small renal mass in a difficult location uh, regarding feasibility for a partial nephrectomy trigger you to do surgery earlier versus active surveillance? That's a great question because it can do both. Um, you know, if, if you know that the risk of doing a radical nephrectomy for one of these small renal masses is higher, uh, it certainly makes act, uh, active surveillance uh, more uh, desirable, particularly in the elderly um, and so, or someone with compromised renal function. Uh, but in someone who's younger, um, who are concerned uh, with what this thing is going to do over time, uh, yeah, then the the... Uh, earlier intervention does come into play in terms of maximizing the probability of being able to do partial nephrectomy, for sure. Okay. Um, someone else wanted to know, in your practice, do you often biopsy small renal masses? Do you, does your yeah. institution have a protocol on this? Um, I almost always biopsy these uh, masses, and I, I usually advise that we do it. But again, we do, I follow the protocol, I always wait till they're two centimeters in size um, and don't try to biopsy before then. And um, we don't follow any particular protocol. It's done, our interventional radiologists are the ones that do the biopsies. Uh, they do a good job. Like I mentioned before, since we have, we have kind of an issue where the cytopathologists are still reading the biopsies. I think our surgical pathologists would generally do better with the core biopsies, but um, I don't know. That's really neither here nor there. Um, do you recommend alternating between various imaging modalities, such as renal ultrasound, CT, or MRI, to minimize um, radiation uh, to the patients? Well, I never, I never follow anybody routinely with CT scan because of the because of the uh, radiation issues. So I'll follow most people with MRI, especially early on, because I think the quality of the images is is greater and more reproducible than ultrasound. The ultrasounds are very tech uh, dependent. Um, we have very good techs uh, at Northwestern, and probably I'm sure all you guys do too. Uh, but still, there's there's a it's dependent on their their particular study. And so, for someone who I've been following for a while. Uh, and they're getting to the point where they're almost getting tired of seeing me back every year. Ultimately, we'll switch over to ultrasound because it's a, it's an easier test. It's less expensive. And if you've been looking at this thing for a long time and it really hasn't done anything, I think it's good enough. Okay. Um, someone wanted to know if you could discuss your management of complex renal cysts um, that you are concerned for. Cystic RCC, do you MRI? Uh, and when do you biopsy? Um, I very rarely biopsy them unless they have a real dominant uh, nodular component that I think that the, you know, our radiologists can actually hit. And they're pretty good at it. Um, but it depends a little bit on where this nodule is. So I, I don't usually do biopsy. Um, the, in terms of following them, I think MRI is very helpful. It's very helpful because you can look at now. Keep in mind that MRI does overestimate the Bosniak classification. So if you get someone who's a 2F on CT scan, I know it's somewhat subjective, but 
you get someone who's a 2F on CT scan, it's probably gonna look like a three on MRI. So just keep that in mind. But I do use MRI because um, it, it, I like to look at the T2 weighted images to see what proportion of the tumor appears to be um, cystic and what appears to be solid. And I think you can follow that over time and it's easy to go back and compare. Okay, thank you. Um, someone wanted to know uh, what your thoughts were on partial nephrectomy for T3A. Um, well, I, I usually, so I would not advocate doing that just in general. Um, I think you'd have to be very selective in your patient population that you were and I assume you're talking about uh, extension to the uh, renal vein. Um, generally, you wouldn't know about perinephric fat involvement ahead of time, unless you happen to catch a biopsy, but that's pretty unusual. Um, it would have to be a very selective patient who really, um, say like somebody with a solitary kidney. And, and that might be a reasonable um, person to try it in, in terms of just the risk of disease recurrence. Okay. Um, regarding patients with multiple tumors or familial diseases, uh, do you prefer open versus robotic partial nephrectomy? Well, it's, that has to be kind of a case-by-case -case basis, but I think if you're talking about the familial diseases just in general, um, unless they happen to be, you know, happen not to be on the, uh, the very, if they're on the very low end of the spectrum of their renal disease, then I suppose you could probably justify a robotic approach. Um, generally, though, I think you're probably better off with an open approach. And just because I think it's easier to more quickly uh, get the tumors out and you can do it with cold ischemic time as opposed to warm ischemic time. Um, and then, you know, you, you can also, and keep in mind, too, that in terms of approaching these uh, uh, familial uh, cancers that that a nucleation is probably a reasonable option if you're trying to get four or five tumors out they're a reasonable size um, a nucleation can help you get them out relatively quickly and decrease your risk of bleeding and maximize the renal parenchyma that you're preserving because you're, you're not going to remove every single cancer cell in that patient you're just setting back the clock okay um Back to active surveillance, do you allow tumors to be larger when putting older or sicker patients on active surveillance? And if so, how, how large are you comfortable with? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question too. Um, it really depends on the patient. Uh, you know, I've had 90-year-olds um, who you know, have seven, eight centimeter tumors that we've, we were deciding to watch. Now, it's in those patients, it's very helpful to do the biopsy because while Furman grade is not reliable on the biopsy, like we mentioned, um, histology can help you a lot. Uh, if you do a biopsy and you get a clear cell papillary histology that's very low in the aggression scale, th that helps you a lot because even if it's seven or eight centimeters, you know, you can probably safely watch that with a low risk of developing metastatic disease. Um, if it's type 1 papillary, they tend to be a little bit lower on the risk scale. Uh, so you can, or, or chromophobe, of course, too. So you can actually gain some useful information by doing a biopsy to help you kind of guide the management. But there is no, you know, there's no hard and fast rules about size and active surveillance. I mean, obviously, you know, T1A is more desirable for active surveillance. But if you have someone who's going to do real poorly with your surgery or is very high risk, then you know, they're frequently better off just watching them. Mm -hmm. um, and what is your typical follow-up imaging uh, modality and, and time frame between um, images for small renal masses? Yeah, um, so I'll typically use MRI in my, I'll start with every six months, typically for, you know, a year, a couple sessions and go out to every year. Um, you know, with the growth rate of these things, I think people, frequently over image them. I mean, if you've gone a couple six month sessions and you really haven't seen uh, significant growth or very slow growth, why would you continue at six months? Uh, even some of those, um, some of the active surveillance trials, I think we're over imaging people. And ultimately, I'm sorry, ultimately I like 
like I said, I'll get out to the point where if I've watched it for several years and it's not doing a whole lot, then going to ultrasound, I think, is reasonable because it's uh, simpler and less expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, and someone else wanted to know when you're counseling patients um, with small renal masses, what do you tell them about ablation therapies? Um, I, I like ablation therapies. I didn't get into the, the slides with uh, treatment options and the outcomes. Um, but the ablative therapies, uh, uh, cryoablation is, is superior to RFA. Um, it, it doesn't have the skip lesions and the collecting system complications that you see with uh, RFA. So cryoablation is the way to go in terms of ablative treatments for renal cell cancers. Um, relative to partial nephrectomy, they do have a higher recurrence risk, um, probably in the order of about 10% across the board. Uh, there's some uh, meta-analysis that have demonstrated that they have a slightly higher risk of progression of their disease. Um, so they're probably best used in higher risk patients and the elderly. Um, and they're also better used for masses that are, you know, around three centimeters or less in size. They're a little simpler to treat. Those that are more peripheral and at least partially exophytic are easier to treat also. Um, I used to treat these percutaneously myself, but I gave them up to the interventional radiologist. But, you know, that's a very good tool to use, but it's probably not one that you want to incorporate in somebody who's in their 50s or, or the otherwise reasonably healthy person. Um, one of the downsides is if you ever think you're going to have to go back and operate on someone again, especially in the familial syndromes, you don't want to do cryoablation. It's very difficult to go back in and try to do anything else on that kidney once it's had to cryoablation. <clears throat> it's very scarred down. Okay, and a few a few people wanted to, uh, you to re-explain the the role of the system, maybe SPECT CT, in the evaluation of a renal mass. Yeah, it actually has kind of a limited role. I just I thought it was kind of an interesting uh, new technique, but it it really can't differentiate chromophobe from oncocytoma. Its its usefulness is in terms of um, defining you know defining a chromophobe from a, uh, excuse me, an oncocytoma from a standard uh, clear cell renal cell carcinoma. Um, it's kind of, it was, I, I think some more studies need to be done to look at its kind of a expanded usefulness, um, but it, it does have a limited role. Okay. Um, uh, someone else wanted to know what your practice was regarding renal mass biopsies in patients that are on anticoagulation. Well, um, since the biggest risk of the biopsy is bleeding, uh, they pretty much need to come off their anticoagulation to have the biopsy. Um, I, you know, it makes it easy at our institution because our radiologists won't do it when someone's on their anticoagulation. So everyone has to have their PT, PTT, and CP mm -hmm. with the platelet count before they'll even schedule them. So, you know, eliminates that question for us. But you know, from a practical standpoint, you don't want to do it if they're on anticoagulation. If you've ever seen a bad bleeding complication from a biopsy, it can be quite, quite bad. Um, and it also, even if you get uh, some hematoma formation post biopsy, nothing that's real dramatic, it can make, if you go on to do a partial nephrectomy, it can make things more difficult for you. So avoiding that issue is, is the best thing to do. Okay. Uh, and does your management of the small renal mass change in end-stage renal disease patients or transplant candidates? Um, so, I mean, yes, it does. Uh, the implications for, uh, for removing the kidney are not as great. So in someone who's on dialysis, uh, you wouldn't do a partial nephrectomy typically. You would just do a radical nephrectomy. Um, someone who's you know, these tend to be, if they have acquired renal cystic disease, these tend to be type 1 papillary cancers. Uh, they're not particularly aggressive. Um, for someone who's a poor surgical candidate, you might consider uh, active surveillance or maybe even doing a biopsy to demonstrate exactly what it is. But in general, you would, if, if any question, uh, you would remove the kidney. For someone who's a transplant candidate, you know, the transplant people, rightfully so, uh, don't like to transplant kidneys and people who have a potential malignancy, so you'd, you'd remove it. Okay. Uh, 
I think we have time for one last question. Um, what is the role of partial nephrectomy in patients with oligometastatic disease um, along with TKIs? Um, <laughs> Tough question. So, yeah, that's a good one. Um, so what was the question, the role of partial it's, nephrectomy? Yep, role of partial nephrectomy in patients with oligometastatic disease. Um, and, they meant, and they added along with PKIs. Okay, so in terms of when we're looking at cytoreductive nephrectomy, um, and you guys know the, da the data on this, the more recent data suggests that um, it may have a more limited role, uh, particularly in those um, with poor performance status. It's probably in general not a very helpful thing to pursue. Um, the role of partial nephrectomy in this group um, is, uh, you know, there's just not much data on it. I mean, I can see incorporating that in somebody who had a relatively smaller primary, a very good performance status in oligometastatic disease. In fact, we've done that. Um, you know, it, but what, there's no, there's really no data out there um, on doing that. And so, I think you have to use kind of common sense. When would you do a partial nephrectomy anyway? Um, as someone who has relatively poor renal function and oligometastatic disease, you'd probably just move forward with their immunotherapeutic treatment, um, which, you know, um, you know, these days probably wouldn't be TCAP, but more, you know, something on the lines of hippie nevo or regimen like that. But, you know, how do you incorporate um, cytoreductive nephrectomy, whether you do a radical nephrectomy or partial nephrectomy, I think you can go either way. But the bigger question is, is, is it appropriate to pursue the site, whatever cytoreductive procedure you're going to look at doing anyway? Um, and I think that that has a lot to do with uh, the burden of the primary, how much tumor uh, is, rests within that primary. If you can get rid of the majority of their tumor burden by doing a cytoreductive nephrectomy and they have a good performance status, I think it's probably worthwhile pursuing. Um, and whether that's, you know, if it's a partial nephrectomy because they have, you know, if they have, you know, a single one or two small metastatic lesions in a relatively small primary, I think it'd be absolutely reasonable to do a partial nephrectomy in that setting. Hope that answers your question. It wasn't too rambling. No, thank you so much for answering all, uh, all of the questions. There's still uh, quite a few questions that we didn't get to answer, but we'll post all the answers on the website. And um, just a reminder for everybody to fill out the survey. Thank you so much, Dr. Perry, for a great talk. And thank great you, guys. Day. Enjoyed it. All right, have a good day. You too.